The next speaker is Stacy Salazar. Stacy Salazar is director of the Master of Arts in Art Education program, a low residency and online program integrating art, ma art making, teaching and research at the Maryland Institute College of Art, MICA. Prior to joining the full-time faculty at MICA, she was the visual arts department chair in a large suburban public high school, the ac accomplishment for which earned her her and her her teachers and students, national and regional recognition. Welcome. Guten Morgen allerseits. Last year at this symposium in New York City, I shared art college student findings from my research. This time, I will share the professor's point of view. I begin with a brief context for the study and then describe four pedagogical practices accompanied by a vignette or short quotation story from the uh, faculty member and conclude with some thoughts for us to consider. Through vignettes from a few different classrooms Oh, sorry, classroom studio settings, I present four pedagogical practices found in first-year college studio art classes, which practices emerged from recent research I conducted at two art colleges in the United States. My review of the literature revealed that there is little research, very little research, about teaching and learning in college studio art classrooms. Moreover, most research into college level instruction relies on what teachers say rather than on actual observation of teacher practice. To address these gaps in 2010, as part of my doctoral research at Columbia University, I conducted a qualitative research study at the School of the Visual Arts in New York City and at the Maryland Institute College of Art in Baltimore. Analysis of field notes, observations, and interviews suggested four categories of pedagogical practice. The first, orchestrating the physical space, refers to ways in which faculty purposefully or intuitively arrange the physical environment during a given studio class session. Before his drawing class arrives, Lewis, a professor of drawing one, places the chairs in a circle in the middle of the studio, just as he does for the beginning of every week's class session. The first 90 minutes of every class meeting take place here, in the circle. Lewis sits with the students in the circle as they discuss experiences and share ideas. Later, in a conversation with me, Lewis explains his reasons for creating the circle. It's the community that I'm wanting to build because the students are going to spend a whole year together in that room. And I feel, I want them to feel confident that if another student says something that is really silly or makes a comment of some kind, I don't want them to be afraid of that. I want them to understand that this is a protected environment in which they're supposed to learn. A second pedagogical practice, structuring the creative process. The six instructors in this study structure the creative process over the course of the studio sessions. That is, they set parameters for how and when students will undertake steps in the creative process. The findings suggest that there were three methods of structuring the creative process characteristic to these six particular professors. Those three methods are learning by doing, crafting learning experiences, and crafting a creative milieu learning by doing, all the teachers had the students engage with skills they wanted the students to learn, such as mixing color, making and reflecting on drawn marks, and experiencing qualities of power tools. This was the case even in a studio course where students did not make any work at all during class time. Instead, they engaged one another in dialogue about art ideas and processes, and the professor identified skills in a conversation with me he identified skills in interpersonal conversations as one of the primary objectives of his course. In addition to acquiring proficiency in skills, the professors in the study identified perseverance, developing a work ethic, 
paying attention or careful observation, and, quote, being present in the moment, all as hoped-for outcomes from learning by doing. A second method for uh, learning by doing, or sorry, for structuring the creative practice um, is crafting learning experiences. Crafting learning experiences may be thought of as the particular constraints or parameters an instructor establishes. These parameters were evident in the steps or processes a teacher prompted students to take in order to accomplish a given assignment. Professors usually describe the intentions behind setting parameters as nurturing an appreciation for quote, the process, or the journey, or the moment. The sculpture professor described the way he structured the creative process for a project involving joining pieces of wood. He described it in this way. Sketch it, that's the first step into reality. And then that sketch, <clears throat> the student wonders, is that what they really wanted? Then what usually happens is I say to them, I want measurements. So then the student has to start deconstructing their idea. They have to see their idea in its concept and start breaking it apart. I believe it's a new way of thinking for these students. They're going to have to start thinking forwards and backwards. Then they'll go to the machine to cut it, and the machine's going to be whistling and high-pitched, so it's like, oh, the machine doesn't want to do that. How are you going to get around that problem? And then we have to sit there and figure it out. So they really have to start paying attention to their environment. They've done everything they're supposed to do, but the reality of the material stops them. Now, what are they going to do? So they, all that sketch and all that has gone before is now gone. And then they have exactly what's in front of them. But all of that was necessary to come to this moment. A third method for structuring the creative process, crafting a creative milieu. Faculty valued different kinds of learning environments, or milieu. Both painting professors in the study, there were two, expressed a preference for a studio in which students make work steadily, for example. Other instructors specified they sought a classroom milieu in which students felt safe, empowered, and able to take risks. The drawing professor, for example, described a strategy he thought would lead to increasing a young artist's understanding while also allowing her to be empowered as the agent of her own work. He said, by using an eraser on her charcoal drawing and not graphite, I'm making marks that are imminently changeable, correctable, so I won't interfere with her drawing and later on, she'll be able to get rid of my marks to make sure it is her drawing in the end. The third pedagogical practice, initiating dialogue. My data suggested four ways in which instructors engage students in dialogue. Through questioning strategies, through one-on-one -on -one conversations, through metaphorical anecdotes, and using warm language and tone. Five prof professors in the study asked open-ended questions of students, which questions generated verbal responses. These open-ended and sometimes rhetorical questions were seemingly intended to deepen student thinking or provide students with opportunities to practice articulating their ideas. For example, during a class critique, the sculpture professor simply asked, what constru constructive criticism might we give her? A painting professor standing over a student's work in progress wondered aloud, so, you feel like the shadows should be darkened? And when initiating a conversation about a work in progress, a drawing professor asked a student artist, what did you discover? All the teachers in this study engaged in one-on-one -on -one conversations with students, either while students were working or when students sought instructors out with questions or problems. Most conversations were about the studio subject matter at hand. Some instructors made a point of speaking with every student individually at least once during every class. For instance, one drawing and two painting professors kept a log <clears throat> of students they had spoken with that day to ensure they talked with everyone during the five-hour class session. This was not always easy. For one painting professor, the commitment to speak with every student necessitated walking between three campus buildings because the students were undertaking an on-location observational painting in settings of their own choosing. 
A few faculties told stories or jokes with metaphorical content as a form of one-on-one -on -one dialogue. For example, they suggested that getting to know materials is like dating. Dedication to art making is like disciplining oneself to exercise every day. And appreciating diverse artworks resembles a relationship with Brussels sprouts. When I asked the sculpture professor to explain the Brussels sprouts story, he shared with me that students during a critique, sorry, that he had shared with students during a critique, he told me these stories deepen his students' understanding. Quote, I can talk about Brussels sprouts, freshly prepared Brussels sprouts versus frozen Brussels sprouts. And I talk about preparing them, and you know, you can see the students thinking about cooking. And then I share with them the fact that I don't like Brussels sprouts prepared either way, but I can tell the difference between properly prepared or well-prepared Brussels sprouts and the ones poorly prepared, and that therefore this notion of quality is not contingent upon taste or personal like or dislike. The fourth and final pedagogical practice that emerged um, from my study, modeling ways of being an artist and citizen. Through sharing stories of their professional and personal lives, studio professors modeled what it is like to be an artist and adult in the world. Speaking to his students, a drawing professor said, I feel much more excited about the work I'm doing now than I did 10 years ago. It's more interesting. It's certainly more connected to what I've always wanted to do in terms of how all the elements of my life are working in my work. And if I make a better piece now than I did three months ago, then that's good. The latest piece is always my best, but it doesn't necessarily retain that position. Prior to engaging in the study, most participant professors had neither consciously defined these practices nor considered the potential outcomes. At the conclusion of the research project, several professors remarked that articulating their practices, what they did and why, was empowering for them. As one professor said, I realize there's a method to my madness. I propose, therefore, that encouraging professors to move from teaching intuitively to teaching intentionally enriches art teaching and learning. Awareness of pedagogical practices empowers professors to reflect on their teaching, to modify or augment it, and to potentially share those methods with others. In addition, describing their own pedagogical practices, possibly using the four categories identified here today in this presentation, provides professors with a language through which to articulate what they do and why. Communicating tacit practices would enhance the ability of programs and institutions in contemporary post-secondary studio art to evaluate the degree to which they are delivering education that is valuable and worthwhile. So the question before us this morning is, how might we in studio art support art professors in learning the skill of reflection that they might move from teaching intuitively to teaching intentionally? Thank you.